the Buddhist Theosophical Society. And they could expect to get an education at least up to secondary level. Some did not go to tertiary level, but up to secondary level, free of charge. But that was only one of the other, one of the ingredients in that package. The second ingredient was education in English language. That was part of the reforms. And third was what was called the central college system, where there were residential colleges dotted throughout the country where bright children should come into, could come into those schools. And I think uh, if you look at any big audience like this in Sri Lanka, you'll have a large number of people who have built their career on that system. They had access to education. They had access to some sort of English language education. Not perhaps the younger people, the others had that. And also many of them came through the central school system that created a very strong backbone of education in Sri Lanka. But then I come to the bad part of it. Item number one of free education remained, but the other two were dropped on various political and other considerations. All along the way, the idea of the central college was completely, I would say, disemboweled. You had the name, but it was no longer the old central college that was envisaged, brilliant colleges, with very, very, very bright students, particularly from rural homes, who had very good education in international languages and made a magnificent contribution to Sri Lanka in the years after independence. Now that is where the crisis began, because at a certain stage, due to populism, I would say populism, because the pressure on education was so much, investments could not be made, so what they did was they changed the name board. All the schools that had kindergarten, junior school, senior school, they removed that board and called it central school. So the idea of a central college was there, the name board of a central college was there, but not the content or the spirit of education. So now in the present government we have had to revamp that whole education system to make it a science educate where you push education towards a science culture and that is what is now called the Mahindodaya system where government is going to reorganize the whole educational structure so that the country will be dotted with a large number of science colleges where even there will be dual language instruction and certainly a large investment in information technology. So that is, you have to build the basis of this development paradigm for use of education, information technology, etc. by state investment in creating that soft infrastructure through the education system. That is the vision of our president and of our government. Now this is, this requires a large investment, very much like the investment we make on physical infrastructure. Very often it is not understood. And secondly, this is something that is going to take some time. But there are good signs of this transformation. If you look at the Sri Lankan economy, it is undergoing a rapid change, which is not so visible. If you look at our countryside, we have 21 million people, 210 lakhs of people. There are 220 lakhs of mobile telephones. We have more mobile telephones in this country than the population. I personally feel it was as a result of opening up the market. When we were young, I think Daya and all will remember, it was very difficult to get a telephone. When you were a young officer, it was almost impossible to get a telephone. You had to go to so and so, go and go. 
today and sometimes we used to we used to joke that it would take at least 10 years to get a telephone and that was some old instrument but today within 10 minutes you can get a mobile phone and there are 220 lakhs of telephones circulating in this country there are 2.7 million 27 lakhs of motorcycles in this country of a population of 20 million population of 20 million 2.7 motorcycles 1 million three wheelers you know this tuk tuk 1 million of those we have over 500,000 lorries which have gone into rural areas and other vehicles. So a big transformation is taking place which needs a new scientific technology. In the past people could not even get a motor, their bicycle repaired. They had, they had to have a special place to have a bicycle repaired. But today we are introducing a new science and technology oriented science and technology oriented culture which will create so many job opportunities if you look at the agricultural sector we can't get people to go back to the same old system of agriculture you take buffaloes or have a plow or go in a span cloth I mean that is simply not possible and as a result what is happening is that the share of though in real terms our agriculture is expanding in terms of share of GDP it is being reduced that is a normal phenomenon as countries grow the agriculture sector it shrinks in relation to GDP not that in, in real terms it expands but wealth more wealth is created in the manufacturing and the service sectors that is what we are seeing now the contribution the ratio contribution to GDP of agriculture is diminishing on the other hand our service sector very much like for example tourism like construction like infrastructure development financial services these are expanding at a terrific pace so we want to make Sri Lanka given our hub position in Asia a knowledge hub and this is our next step to make it a knowledge hub we have to make it a joint enterprise earlier the state had to do everything but today the state is not in a position to make all those investments so it has to be shared somewhere because I'm very glad that the chairman of UGC is also here because we had to confront that problem large numbers of people almost a large fraction of the number of people who are going into our universities were going abroad isn't that so and they would go even to various other countries which didn't have a developed uh, education system certainly not as much developed as ours a lot of middle class people were spending money to send their children abroad because they couldn't find the state system was not expanding enough to include these people but now as we just heard the vice chancellor of this university there are other new ventures where we will have to expand our tertiary education our university education to cater to this vast potential of science oriented people who will be utterly frustrated or will have to prevail on their parents to send them to some godforsaken country to do their higher studies because of policy difficulties here. So we have to change that policy to make Sri Lanka an education hub and that is the next step that we are going to undertake. So basically what I want to argue is that in the modern world when we are going towards a globalized economy when prosperity depends on while ensuring food security and so on in our own country while ensuring a prosperous rural community we also enter into the global market 
in a competitive manufacturing and service industry. Today, our economy is very much based on service industry, though we don't mention it. The highest income we get today from remittances abroad. We have 1.2 million Sri Lankans working abroad. And they are sending us 7 billion US dollars. 7 billion US dollars comes in every year. And just when people are, like in our ministry, we are talking about how to formulate the budget for the coming year, this is a great comfort zone. Every year it is going up and we eventually we are thinking of 10 billion US dollars coming in from remittance. So it's the same in Bangladesh, it's the same in certain parts of India like Kerala and so on. Isn't that so? Mr. So it's like that. So it's a great area of foreign reserves. Then number two is our garment sector where we have a very, very innovative garment sector which is going up to the top ends of the garment industry when because we became a middle income country we did not get the GSP plus the preferential tariffs that were given to certain countries by particularly by the European Union the US preferential tariff still remains but our garment industry has adapted itself it's a very good example of modern technology being used, high-end scientific technology, and today, though of course its component in global textile industry is very small, it is a high low in, highly innovative and an upmarket garment industry. I think all of you would have visited some of our uh, malls here. Some of I don't want to mention names because that, that's, that will be unfair commercial advantage, but we have a lot of uh, malls here and you can see the quality of the product. The cost is very reasonable, high quality product. Th that is a byproduct of the type of garment industry that we have developed and it will develop into a 10 billion dollar as we can expect, a 10 billion dollar enterprise. Then, then we also have tourism. It's also growing very fast. By next year, we expect to have 2.5 million tourists coming into this country. So these are all in the service sector, which requires new thinking, innovation, new areas. And it will also impact even in our domestic sector, even in agriculture. We cannot think of sustaining agriculture unless we can modernize with new equipment. And recently we had a discussion even in parliament about in the eastern province and in the in the in Polonnaru Anuradhapura districts, now they have in, from India they have brought a big harvester, you know, so that uh, and people have given, given names like Bhutya, Yaka, you know, which they can't, that it's a gaul that they can't understand what this is, because earlier where they used very simple mechanisms, now with this in half an hour or something you can do all that. Uh, it not only harvests but it. it bags it and does all that. So that sort of innovation, actually that was a problem because we had to bring workers from India to handle that machinery. It is only now that Sri Lankan young people in villages are able to even manage that harvester, large scale harvester or thresher or whatever you call it. So that type of scientific culture has to be created and particularly in a small country where we have to go for niche markets, then we have to innovate. We have to create an educational system and space in our general growth pattern for this new scientific community. So I think we are going through an interim phase when we are completely revamping our education system. Still we are at the level of uh, primary education and basic education but as we go along it will impact on secondary education and then on tertiary and then university education it will go along so once you set this new curriculum and new structure once you set it loose then obviously it is going to go on impacting to the higher classes in the years to come so we have to plan for that